Hey, I'm Matt Ruby. And I'm Rob Kramer. Welcome to another episode of Hell and Wellness. And I am a stand-up comedian back when stand-up comedy was a thing. And uh, I love the wellness stuff that makes you healthy. And I hate the pretentious world around it that's full of BS. And I'm a tech entrepreneur and a writer who's been kind of delving into this health and wellness thing for decades, always chasing gurus and new methodologies and types of nutritional paths and love it all, follow it all and uh, try to make sense of it. And maybe we can make a little sense for you too. Yeah. And what we're doing in this podcast is we're looking at the different trends and traditions in the health and wellness space, trying to get past, you know, all the uh, haze of what's being said about it and focus on what's actually there. I've heard uh, some refer to uh, us, Matt, as the Siskel and Ebert of health and wellness. Seems kind of apropos. I don't know if you even know who yep. Siskel and Ebert are. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about two uh, interesting topics. Uh, we're going to be talking about Michael Pollan, author of Omnivore's Dilemma, How to Change Your Mind, a bunch of other stuff. And then we're going to be talking about Headspace, the meditation app, which, by the way, we also talked about Buddhist meditation in episode two. So if you're interested in that topic, you might want to check that out. Sound good? I am super excited, especially to talk to you about Headspace, because I've got my thoughts about that thing. Anyway, should we get our, to our first segment? Yeah, let's do it. Here we go. And quick note, we are not doctors. This is not medical advice. Don't take us that seriously and change your life and inject things or anything like that. We're here to entertain you, to give you our perspective on the world of wellness. So please, before you do anything serious, check with the doctor. So Rob, there's probably one person who's changed the way I eat more than anyone else, and that is Michael Pollan. Are you familiar with Michael Pollan? I am very familiar. Love his books. Yeah, I think it's tough really now to remember a time, uh, you know, 2006 is the year The Omnivore's Dilemma came out, which is where I think is a good place to start a conversation about Michael Pollan. Um, and for those who don't know, he's an author, uh, journalist, professor, I think at uh, Cal Berkeley, you know, foodie and, and like an omnivore's dilemma. I think it's hard to remember a time before that book came out, before it sort of transformed how we talk about uh, the local food movement, organic food and sort of how we were eating before that. And I think, you know, so many things have changed in our culture. And I think in large part, you can pinpoint that book and the way he approached the subject of food in a way that like we had never really seen before. And I, I remember feeling like, you know, I kind of knew that the way we were eating as a society w was, you know, bullshit and, and leading to all kinds of terrible things. But I was just like, that's just the way it is. Americans can't be convinced to eat differently. We're just like this fast food culture that wants, you know, you know, to eat, uh, you know, terrible fast food and drink soda and stuff like that. And then this book came out and I think it really was sort of like this great combination of like sort of a, a great premise of taking four meals and sort of like one uh, was a fast food meal. One was like a regular supermarket meal. One was a more like organic grocery store meal. And one was a meal where he hunted uh, or grew or made everything himself. And that framework he used as this template to investigate where our food comes from in this fascinating way that I think was sort of great journalism, great storytelling, and had this super important message that wound up resonating in our culture and, and taking off. Um, and so I, I kind of wanted to walk through some of the things that even to this day, you know, you know, nearly a decade after I, I read that book, how it still resonates with me. Uh, but I'm curious first if there, your, your connection with, with that book and, you know, if it you know, had any impact on you or if you were already eating healthy at that point, being, you know, sort of the, the savvy California guy that you are. Well, um, I'm not sure about that, but I was eating relatively healthy, but I was very much intrigued by that book. That is the first Michael Pollan book that I that I uh, I read. I did read In Defense of Food after that, and then uh, I think I skipped all the way to a book, which I imagine you're going to talk about, called How to Change Your Mind. Um, what I found fascinating, to your point, was that um, he really challenges us uh, about the assumptions we grew up with around food and the four food groups and actually what the Ford food groups act even meant. Uh, you know, the Ford food groups were ingrained in us from the time of um, uh, uh, grade school. 
and we knew them by rote and our parents followed them and it was the gospel and the Bible. And I think that uh, Michael Pollan really kind of synthesized for me everything that uh, I had assumed to be true, but um, uh, isn't, was no longer true for me after reading that book. Totally. Yeah. The food pyramid also, he completely kind of debunks that. You know, I remember us growing up like that, the, the healthy breakfast where you're supposed to have like a full glass of milk and orange juice and bacon and all, you know, all this other stuff. And, you know, just sort of like explains how much that was, you know, he, I think that's what's great about it is he gets this sort of really organic, you know, look at, at uh, how things are grown, but then also looks at all the politics and, and following the money of like, you know, ConAgra and these, these big agriculture firms and how they paid off the FDA and all the stuff that was going on beyond. And I, I just think he's like a great sort of uh, synthesizer of ideas. I think he took a lot of things that were out there that maybe, you know, people in, in Berkeley knew about and people who were farmers knew about and people who were in D.C. knew about but synthesize them in a way that was interesting and digestible. And even like the, the main sort of phrase that he came up with for how you should eat, eat food, not too much, mostly plants, you know, like seven words that sums up everything that was so difficult for so long for people to sort of comprehend. And, and also I think the idea like don't eat anything that your grandmother wouldn't recognize as food, you know, such a simple sort of concept and yet it says so much and i think he's really great at that it's sort of boiling these things down to simple things i was surprised when i read that book that it had taken someone so long to actually come to these awarenesses um i grew up with a sister and brother who were about uh nearly a decade older than me they were 18 months apart and i grew up in the 70s and my sister was a vegetarian in the 70s wow. and she was like you know one of these pioneers and we grew up in pittsburgh and she started the first food co-op which was a natural food co-op which back then was as crunchy as you can get i mean there was dirt between your toes if you walked into that store uh, and everything was in bulk and um i remember writing a paper in in um eventually in high school about plant-based diets and just not eating a lot of meat and testing all those assumptions and i thought this is to most people super weird, but to not to me because my sister and brother were influencing me. But then I read the book and I had forgotten about it. And it was like, holy shit, like this has taken a few decades. Definitely. Yeah. I had the same experience. My mom was very into, you know, eating seaweed and going to like the one organic food store that was three towns away. And, and it used to be like for kind of crazy people. You were like a little bit of a wackadoo and dismissed by mainstream society if you wanted to eat organically. And, you know, all of a sudden, like how that has shifted in the past, you know, 20 years, I think is fascinating and, and owes a lot to Paul. And, and like some of the things I'll just bring up from that book that have stuck with me. Uh, one is the idea of, you know, what actually happens at factory farms. This idea of, of cows that actually are standing in their own manure, shot up with steroids and hormones and how like disgusting and revolting what happens at factory farms is, um, has changed. I still eat meat, but I you know really try hard to get it from places where the animals are being treated in like a, a mindful way and not being tortured. And you know the, the other side of that is how much more delicious things are when they are actually natural and organic. And when you actually taste the difference, and this is for vegetables too, when you taste the difference between these things, you're like, oh, I didn't know this is what like, you know, a carrot could taste like when it's coming out of the ground and fresh and not, not given all this, these poisons in order to grow. And I think that also, as soon as you get a taste of that, it's hard to go back. And it's interesting how the times we grow up in really dictates um, the food habits and the nutritional habits. Uh, obviously, we grew up in a time like you said, in factory farms in Madison Avenue, packaging things up and making them super convenient and super easy for us to the fact that we could have like seasonal fruits and vegetables all year round in Pittsburgh, where I grew up. I mean, seriously, Pittsburgh, fresh fruits and vegetables. The only thing that was fresh were, were like the steel mill furnaces coming out of the uh, the steel mills on the Monongahela <laughs> River. But um, the uh he really did. He, he he really did do a lot for sort of opening our minds up to what uh, integrating our sort of species with the uh, food that we ingest. And that truly, and he didn't coin this phrase, but the phrase had been around a long time. Uh, in fact, I think there was a book called You Are What You Eat. Yeah. And I mean, some of the things that also stuck with me was this idea that at the supermarket, anything that says that it's healthy on it isn't. Anything that says low fat, anything that says light, anything that says healthy 
that's how you know it's not actually healthy for you because you know it doesn't have that potatoes cauliflower there's no that's low right. fat potatoes at the supermarket i remember reading that and being like god this is like brilliantly stated in a way that like to this day i haven't forgotten that's the impact of how he explains stuff and how about the word natural which means absolutely nothing like the word natural can be used by anyone anywhere it, you could be monsanto putting ddt in your fruits and vegetables and you could say it's natural it's natural DDT. It, everything is natural. natural. It exists. Everything's it's natural. here. It's on the planet. It was. It, it's natural plastic. Don't worry about it. You know. That's right. Um, and another concept from the book is the, uh, that I really liked was this notion of the soul of a carrot because I think it gets at something with how we treat science in our culture. And he talks about how scientists are always trying to isolate. You know, like what's the thing in a carrot that makes it so healthy? Let's let's try to isolate it and put it in a pill, and then we can just take our our B twelve or whatever pill. And the thing that we don't really understand is this idea that we don't really know what's going on inside of plants. We don't really understand it that you can't isolate what's happening in the carrot and just pick out the one good part that there's it's almost got a soul that is all integrated in a way that we can't just you know with our western science and rationalism like isolate the healthy part and then get rid of the rest that you need to take a carrot in its totality and what what's fascinating to me is that here we are in a new era of thinking about food thinking about health obviously in the time of covid the foods we eat the nutrition that we heal ourselves with are so completely um, disconnected and disjointed from our our lives that most Americans especially do not eat particularly healthy diets. It fascinates me, though, when there's information like this out there um, that people will insist on uh, adhering to the old habits, even if they have some sense that they aren't good for them. And this notion that you can eat a fast food meal seven days a week and that that somehow cumulatively is going to add up to a healthy lifestyle uh, or you're not going to gain, you know, 30, 40, 50 pounds is, is, is astonishing to me. And I, 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 I guess that it's just something that it's really access to information and whether or not you're resistant to the information or not. But uh, Michael Pollan certainly has opened up our, our, our eyes and, and ears and cells to the possibilities. So then let's fast forward from, I, I would say that's how he broke on the scene. And then afterwards he wrote a couple other books, you know, sort of more food based. Uh, also had a, a couple TV shows, uh, one on Netflix called Cooked. That's pretty good. The other one I saw, I wasn't that crazy about. But I think then he did sort of like, what was his logical next step? I, I, I see Omnivore's Dilemma as sort of like a love letter to plants and how it can help heal you in, in the food that you eat. And I, th and I think the next step that he took was like, well, what can plants do for your brain? And that's where we go to, uh, first there was a New Yorker article called The Trip Treatment. And then from there, it, that evolved into a book called How to Change Your Mind, which is about the history and future of psychedelic drugs, where he brings that same sort of journalistic approach to psychedelics, focusing mostly on psilocybin, but also some other stuff. Psilocybin is what's found in magic mushrooms. And really bringing that sort of journalistic rigor to you know taking something that for decades has been in, in the shadows and kind of secretive and you know not talked about in, in mainstream society or in you know the medical sphere and shining a light on it and taking that sort of like not a hippy dippy kind of like this is cr amazing or like you know not like some he's a square he's like kind of a dork who's never done psychedelics before but goes into that world explores them takes them interviews a bunch of experts interviews people who conduct these uh sort of healing sessions and i think really does s something similar to what he did for like local organic food for psychedelics to to bring them out of the shadows and into the sunshine in a way that gets people who maybe would have been dismissive of them uh, otherwise to kind of accept that oh maybe there's some really cool stuff here that you know maybe it's not all the the uh, scary stories that of you know you take these and you go diving out of a second floor window that you know we were shown in after school specials you know when I was growing up and so I, I think you know that is a continuation of his work of like sort of uh, you know what can plants do to help heal us and uh, a message that our society sorely needs you know Michael Pollan uh, especially when he came out with the um uh, his 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 book on how to change your mind and psychedelics kind of reminded me of um, sort of Morgan Spurlock of Super Size Me with a conscience, like he and, just and went all journalistic in. rigor, like a real journalist, which I you know I know nowadays we don't talk about, but like there's value to that. 
when you come in with that skeptical notion and like, okay, I don't know if I buy it, prove me wrong, and I'm going to interview people on all sides. There's value to that that I feel like we're losing. Yeah. I mean, I think that I, I appreciated his sort of immersive investigative journalism approach to these books uh, and that he puts himself, especially with How to Change Your Mind, into these roles and positions. I think that uh, for most people who do see him as a little bit more of a journalistic square or someone who you wouldn't imagine uh, taking, uh, uh, participating in these kinds of uh, plant-based experiences, um, it sort of opens, hopefully opens up their minds into uh, wondering what that might be like and, uh, you know, trying it themselves and perhaps the world might be a better place if everyone actually dipped their toe. Yeah, or at least being tolerant of other people doing it in a way that's like, oh, we're not going to throw people in jail who are maybe trying to help heal, uh, you know, like, you know, other people who are going through, you know, end of life or PTSD or something else to like not have it be a punitive thing in our society. Yeah. You know, I have to say, though, um, having uh, read the book, How to Change Your Mind and having experienced a lot of the things that he talks about in the book, whether it was from meditation to psilocybin uh, and uh, LSD, et cetera, um, I, I was a little taken aback in the book by the context within which he sometimes referenced the experiences, whether it was Burning Man or Silicon Valley, in all of the sort of typical environments that one would, from a headline clickbait sort of perspective, expect that, oh, these are the people that are doing those things, which is why exactly mainstream America doesn't do these things. And I thought that, um, for me, that was a little bit problematic because I felt like it actually undermined the credibility of the content and the experience that he was sharing. Um, that said, it probably makes for good book sales. It probably makes for good sort of hyperbolic uh, sort of descriptions of what it must be like to be Larry and Sergey doing LSD at Burning Man. Uh, at the same time, I don't know that that's something that, um, you know, uh, Joe and Mary America could actually relate to. But I'd be curious as to how many truly mainstream uh, middle American folks uh, took to that book. Yeah, I think it's uh, where the wave is breaking is in Berkeley and San Francisco and L.A. and New York and Boston and like, you know, you, where the studies are going on now, NYU. And uh, I think Johns Hopkins has a, has a lot of studies going on around it. So I just think inherently you're going to be gravitating towards those places as opposed to, um, you know, uh, the Midwest or even, you know, I, something I would have uh, – enjoyed seeing as an exploration of how these, you know, medicines are used in indigenous cultures. You know, he takes very much this sort of, and I get why he does it, but the Western scientific based, you know, this should be done, you know, in a hospital like setting, you know, where there's white walls and there's someone supervising you and things like that. And I get why he's doing that. That's the way America works. But I do think we miss as a society some of like the rituals that go on within Native American cultures or South American cultures around the use of psychedelics. And, and you know, but we're just not at that point in our society where like, you know, some some, you know, Native American shaman is going to be able to uh, convince uh, Americans that they should trust him. So, I, I you know, but yeah, I, I, I wouldn't want to do mushrooms for the first time in some hospital like setting with white walls with, you know, a dude, you know, watching me the entire time while I'm blindfolded. That to me does not sound like a great or my ideal, you know, version of doing psychedelics. But I guess maybe that's what it takes to get mainstream society on board is to go through that sort of, you know, clinical process around it. Good for Michael Pollan that he takes on these big topics, digs deep, sort of a journalistic perspective, makes the information accessible for people who wouldn't otherwise have it and um, and sort of moves it into a sort of New York Times bestseller where people who wouldn't have otherwise know about it, think about it, or even be curious about it, get to experience it on some level, even if it's on the page. Totally, totally. Yeah, I think he's just threading such a hard needle, and uh, I'm always really impressed. I will say, you know, uh, one other thing, if I had to nitpick, is that it's a real focus on people who have some sort of problem, like that there's, you know, you're, you're been given a chronic uh, or a diagnosis or that you're a terminal diagnosis or you're suffering from PTSD or something else. And that that is sort of the overwhelming focus of when you should be using psychedelics with just a, a small touch at the end where he talks about the betterment of well people 
which I think is a great phrase. And I do think what I would love to see is psychedelics sort of embraced as like, you don't have to be like super fucked up and you're using this to, to cure something that you can already be doing okay, but maybe reach like a, a different stage of enlightenment. And so I, I think, you know, the more we can focus on that moving forward, the better we'll be. But I get why he, you know, had to take the approach that he takes. So I, I think at that point, well, you know, like, why don't we wrap this up? Uh, you know, I, 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 I've been pretty clear about my take on Michael Pollan. He's been uh, super influential about the way I eat, I would say, with How to Change Your Mind and the psychedelic stuff. It's more sort of been things that I already knew myself, but I've never seen someone articulate them as well or in a, a way that's as effective for the mainstream population coming on, on board. So I'm super happy he's doing that. So for me, Michael Pollan is definitely a well. And I would agree. I think Michael Pollan uh, in whole and in mostly part uh, is a well. I think that uh, we need a voice like him. We need someone who's willing to take the risk and try new things in ways that uh, are accessible to people who wouldn't be the pioneers like the Silicon Valley uh, and Burning Man type folks um, and the folks on the coasts. Uh, I think he's an incredible writer, obviously a great thinker, and uh, he's a well for me. We can't change every little thing that happens to us in life. But we can change the way that we experience it. That's the potential of meditation, of mindfulness. You don't have to burn any incense, and you definitely don't have to sit on the floor. All you need to do is to take 10 minutes out a day to step back, to familiarize yourself with the present moment so that you get to experience a greater sense of focus, calm, and clarity in your life. Thank you very much. So that's Andy Puttycomb, uh, the creator of Headspace, giving a TED Talk. And oh boy, that voice, Rob, I, like when I hear Andy Puttycomb's voice, I kind of think we're in love. He's talked to me, probably whispered in my ear more than <laughs> anyone else in my entire life, save for maybe Howard Stern, the two of them, which is an interesting combination, although Howard Stern is very into meditation also. But, you know, Andy, uh, you know, is the creator of Headspace, which is what I use, a guided meditation app. Uh, it's also, there's a, a, a show on Netflix now and the, their empire is expanding. Um, but yeah, so he, and uh, my own personal meditation experience, uh, I had been told that I should try it for years, but, you know, couldn't do it. I had read books on Buddhism and was intrigued, just couldn't do it. Uh, did mindfulness-based stress reduction. My therapist, very into meditation, constantly preaching uh, that I should try it. Just couldn't do it. And Headspace was the first thing that ever stuck. The first uh, kind of not, uh, you know, not getting all religious about it. Uh, and Andy kind of, uh, his background is for over 10 years, he trained as a monk, you know, a uh, Buddhist monk in Nepal and India and Burma. And so he's, he's got the real sort of background of studying with masters, but bringing it in this very sort of uh, um, accessible way to people in a way that stuck with me. And, uh, you know, I know it's not your path into meditation. So I'm curious, you know, how, how you originally got into meditation and, and uh, how you got it to stick. So let me um, undermine everything I'm about to say about meditation and come out and just be super blatant about this. Um, having known Andy, uh, having actually worked on the Headspace app with my technology company early on in the days and knowing Andy and his business partner, um, in fact, they were uh, in our offices um, when we were in, I should say they were in our offices, my offices 10 years ago, um, became their office. Um, I think that Headspace, but for the fact that millions of people uh, would disagree with this, is everything that's wrong with uh, America and meditation. I think it's bullshit. I think that it's in the same way that there is yet another, there's, I could take a pill called Soylent, 
um, and and never have to eat again because Soylent is something that I can just drop into a drink and it'll give me all the so-called nutrition, but I'm missing all of the so-called um, real nutrition that comes with eating and chewing food. I think that um, the notion that Andy at the top of the show here said that you don't need to burn incense. I agree. You don't need to sit on a on the floor. Okay, I mostly agree. But the idea that you can spend 10 minutes a day doing anything and actually go deep on it is, to me, injurious to the promise that Headspace makes. Why does it work? Why is it popular? Because it is an enabler for people to avoid the very thing that meditation provides in the first place, which is some really fucking hard work in going deep into the sort of the depths of the mind, the depths of the sort of sensorial body, and that takes work. And all Headspace does and the guided meditation thing, and you can do meditation for this and meditation for that and meditation for anxiety is bullshit. There is no such thing as meditation for addiction and meditation for not eating and meditation uh, uh, for All right, but weight. you're going all over the map here. Let's, 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 we need to slow down here. Are you opposed to guided meditation in any form? I am not a guided meditation person. I don't think, no. So let me say this. Because I when think I learn got, meditation, you, you seem to be opposed to guided meditation. You seem to be opposed to the length of time that it, it's uh, I am not used. Opposed. And you seem to be opposed to the specificity of like the okay. different packs. So I I'd like to opposed. separate those and, and deal with them individually. Well, let's, okay. I am not opposed to some teacher guiding us into a particular technique of which there are many in learning how to meditate. But there is a point at which the guide needs to go away and the person who is practicing needs to actually focus the mind for a period of time longer than 10 minutes because 10 minutes of meditation is going to create 10 minutes more of focus and attention and that's it. So... My concern here is that you're overly focused on sort of the spiel for how they onboard people and get people interested in Headspace as opposed to the reality of it, which is, you know, 20 minute meditation sessions that are eventually leading you to a point where the guide is uh, saying nothing for the vast majority of the time. So if I am sitting and meditating, I'm using Headspace and I'm sitting for 20 minutes a day and I am, uh, the, the guide's voice is something that's only there for approximately two of those minutes. Now, I'm, now are you still objecting or now we've entered a realm where you're more accepting of it? Uh, I have no problem with the guide being there for 10 minutes. I have no, 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 no. This is a 20 minute uh, meditation session and the guide's voice is heard for about two minutes of it. Okay. So no, I have no problem with that. I have no problem. I, 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 the problem I have is that the statistics will show and I know Headspace well and I know those guys. I know how they built the company. I know who funded the company. I know what their goals were and Rich who runs the company Nice guy. He's from Madison Avenue of London. He's an advertising dude. I get it. I'm not suggesting that it's not, he's not worthy of being the head of a meditation company or not worthy of meditating. But what I am saying is that Headspace and Calm were created to package um, uh, meditation for people who have short attention spans. And that is antithetical to what the hopeful objective is uh, or purpose is of meditation in the first place, which is thousands and thousands of years old. It's a technique. It's thousands of years old. And I would say that it's one of those things where if the Buddha who uncovered Vipassana meditation, which happened to be happens to be the technique I use without going into it could see what was happening, he would be rolling over in his grave and saying, this is purely American, purely Western, and it's actually creating more harm than good. So, yeah, and I, what I'm hearing is you getting caught up on the spiel and the marketing angle of Headspace as opposed Not to my lived reality with it. 
which is I, I'm telling you that I've tried a bunch of other things and they didn't work. And then I tried this and I stuck with it. And now I am at a stage of using it where I do 20 minutes a day where it's not, you know, uh, it's leading up to a point where mostly uh, I am doing the hard work and doing it alone and that I've found it incredibly helpful to have a guide that's brought me to this point. And so it's cha it's a tough for me to uh, have my lived reality denied and told that I'm I'm wrong or have missed the point in some way. So I I I I, I really believe that Headspace is good for bringing people uh, dipping their toe into the ocean. Um, but my sense uh, and my experience is that they will never get you past the. Uh, breaking waves at the shore. You will never go deep if you stay with headspace. I'm not suggesting that you may not find yourself that headspace was your your entry into the ocean. You go like, oh my God, this is what an ocean feels like. I've actually been in situations where people in India who came, I was on a beach once, kids who lived in the mountains who were orphans, they brought them to the ocean for the first time, and I watched these kids dip their toe into the ocean for the first time. They had a profound experience. They had never experienced the ocean. They may never have ever gone into back into the ocean again. Do, do they understand what it's like to swim like a fish in the middle of the ocean? Probably should, not. Are you therefore arguing that no one should have ever brought them to the ocean? No, like, I'm, I'm agree. Isn't it good that someone brought them to the hundred percent? That's what I'm saying. I'm saying that. So rolling back a little bit, I think that headspace is good for that. I think it's really good for bringing you to the edge of the ocean, dipping your toe in, feeling the surf, feeling the spray of the ocean, and um, perhaps the the ions that are sort of you know lapping over your your body. What I'm suggesting is that if that is your understanding if you think that that is the experience and of the technique and the power of meditation and that's where you stop and you only continue in a headspace type of environment then you're actually missing the experience the true law of nature of what the ocean provides and you believe that about all forms of guided meditation i take it once again, I, I, my meditation technique, and I'm not defending one way or the other, starts off, especially my first time in a 10-day silent meditation retreat, starts off every session with a bit of a guide from the teacher, uh, S.N. Goenka, who was my teacher um, in Vipassana. It all starts there. The sessions, though, are not dip-your-toe-in-the-water sessions, the guide is incredibly important, but the sessions, 10 or 20 minutes in a guided environment done and packaged in a way, which I do have an issue with, that Headspace does or Calm does, gives people the illusion that the experience of meditation and the, the technique of meditation, it's not meditation is an experience, it's a technique, of where it's trying to take you to a place of being sensorily um, aware of all sensations on and in your body and thoughts as they arise and pass away without attaching yourself or having an aversion or not being blind and having blind spots is a very, very practiced, effortful experience. And the people that tend to stay only with a headspace type meditation environment are surfing at the superficial level of the mind and is it because i'm view. only doing 20 minutes a day is it a, a length of time i guess i'm kind of confused if no, I do 20 minutes not a day at all my my guide isn't really speaking to me am i not i'm not doing enough um there were times when i only did 20 minutes after spending lots of times going very very long and long sessions and long retreats etc on meditation and i get that that's not practical for most people however uh that's what i wish for 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 most people who want to use meditation as a technique to you know uh quiet the mind and become more peaceful all i'm suggesting is is that the type of meditation in my view Millions of people disagree with me on this. 
in my view, happens to be uh, a superficial technique relative to a headspace or calm environment. And when they believe that that's what meditation is and where, and that's the level to which it takes people, and I'm making a huge assumption that there are people who don't go much deeper, and I'm sure there are by and large, but the people you talk to who by and large in mass do headspace and calm are the very people who will tell you there is no way I could sit and, you know, meditate for an hour a day, or I could never go on a 10 day or a three day meditation retreat. And none of us could have could do that when we first started. But that's the point. The point is that we can't do that because we live in these noisy fucking brains. And that um, I, I, I just hope for that there is some percentage of people who do headspace and calm and these app, these meditation apps who will actually go deeper because that's where the experience of the ocean lives. It doesn't live in the sort of lappy sort of waves at the shoreline. Yeah. And I, personally, I have gone to silent meditation retreats, you know, yet I've returned to Headspace for my daily practice. And when, when I hear you talk about it, which I appreciate your point of view, it's uh, I, I kind of hear uh, the analogy that I would give is like a master chef talking about Blue Apron that you're like, this is nothing to do with cooking. You don't even understand how these, you, it shows up for you. It's all chopped. You're not even doing anything. You don't really understand. And the counterpoint that I would make to that person would be like, yeah, but if they don't get it like this, they're not going to cook at all. It's not that they're going to then leap to the more advanced, better version and go to Le Cordon Bleu and, and become a trained chef. What they're going to do is nothing. And so if there's, you know, when, when you, you lash out, at Headspace and what it's doing. What I think is the real problem here is America and Western culture and our inability to kind of focus on anything in any real way. And what Headspace has tried to do is surf the wave of our culture for where it's at, which is this short attention span, this need to have things gamified. Uh, I don't even like how they break things into packs. There's certain packs. This is for sadness. This is for grief. This is for help you go to sleep. Because that's, that's the I, business model. That's a revenue I, model. I get it, but I'm, all that I'm, tell, I'm telling you that I don't think uh, it's not that if they didn't give it to people, all these people would then go on 10 day silent meditation retreats. I'm telling you they wouldn't meditate so, at all. Yes. So if, if this is the blue I, apron so, meditation, then I'm going to say that it's way better than if it didn't exist. Yeah. So I, I think it's a fair point, Matt. I think that the analogy is absolutely perfect. Um, uh, I being not someone who cooks in the family, my wife does, uh, blue apron while we don't use it probably would be amenable to my style of cooking because I'm not going to cook any other way. Uh, I'm just going to throw it together because it's all been chopped and julienne. So I agree with you that really probably what's driving me around this is almost like a, a frustration and a sadness that people in our society will not go further than Blue Apron, just stick it in a pot and it's all done for you and turn on it to 450 or, you know, take your little packets of meditation for anxiety and meditation for sadness and meditation for marital problems. And like, what the fuck? Like meditation for, you know, taking a shit? Like we can package anything up and sell it to the American consumer. It's unfucking believable. That's the high horse I think I'm on. I completely agree with you. You said, I think the most important thing that really changes my sort of view on this, which is meet people where they're at. And that to me is the most important thing. You're absolutely right about that. I believe that is such an important thing. I'm just sad and frustrated that this is the end game, right? Not the starting game. And to your point, you're meditating 20 minutes now. You're meditating consistently. You know what? Who knows? Maybe you and I will go on a 10-day meditation retreat one day, and that will be the most amazing things. Or maybe we won't. But I just long for having had the experience, not better or worse, doesn't make me better or worse, a better meditator, that there's no meet people where they're at. I just hope for people going beyond headspace and calm. 
I hear you. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, maybe someday, 10 days of not talking to you, Rob, sounds amazing. I can't, I can't wait for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, I get where you're coming from because I do think, and like I said, I think it taps in your frustration is uh, with where our culture is and that, the fact that something needs to be uh, kind of chopped up and packaged this way and, and gamified, uh, and I get that. But nonetheless, I'm going to say that for people who are just onboarding into meditation uh, and and needing some you know ramp into that world that i do think headspace is really well done and for as commercial or you know the the marketing aspects of you seen uh i do find you know when i've heard andy talk and you know how he uh actually conducts the sessions and his background i do think he's coming from at least as far as i can tell a, a genuine place that i've found very helpful in my life so i'm going to give it a well great well and by the way andy is authentic i believe from where he's coming from and it was when he had the desire to create what hopefully I'm sure would be a billion dollar company in the tech space is when he started creating packets for every right. types of, you know, take a shit and, you know, get divorced. Well, I, and I think we'll probably in a future episode get it's capitalism meeting this sort of, uh, you know, uh, mindfulness is like a fascinating intersection that I think we're going to keep coming back to in different ways on the show. So do I actually need to state the, the obvious? Please do. I want to hear it. It's fucking hell. All right. We'll, we'll all go study on the mountaintop like you one day, Rob. <laughs> oh, my. Thanks for listening to Hell and Wellness. I'm Rob Kramer. And I'm Matt Ruby. You can subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts, and you can leave voice messages for us at anchor.fm slash Wellness. That's anchor.fm slash Wellness. You can also see all the shows there. And you can email us at hellandwellness at gmail.com. And if you remember, please uh, rate us and review us on uh, Apple Podcasts. Say something nice. Thanks for listening. This podcast is produced by Stereoactive Media. 